good morning. Yeah, just some introductions first. My name's Paul Cook. I work for the Health and Safety Executive, and I'm with my colleague uh, Nick Johnson here today. We're going to be around for all of today. So, obviously, I'll allow some time for some questions at the end of my talk but we will be around the AIF knowledge base, as I say, if anyone needs a chat in the margins following the presentation. Just a bit about my role. I work for HSE on a policy team, and I look after slips, trips, and fall from high policy. So I'm going to talk today about um, some general updates on worker height matters. Um, I'm also going to formally recognize some of the work that the AIF and other partners have been doing to reduce falls accidents over the years. Um, also, uh, I'd like to talk about some future challenges facing uh, not just worker height policy, but obviously that are impacting on HSE as a whole and will have implications for um, you know, the wider world of health and safety. Okay, I'm going to start off with just some statistics. Um, these are drawn from last year's statistics. Uh, just to give you a bit of a feel for the volume of accidents and injuries and what's, what the causes are uh, when we talk about falls from height. So I'd start by saying there is a lot of work being done uh, to address uh, falls accidents. And this goes way back. This goes back to HSE's uh, Fit Free program, which you know, roughly five to ten years ago now, and um, obviously we've seen the implementation of the worker height regulations in 2005, which consolidated older previous sets of regulations, and we've been looking at the impact of that. We also had the uh, HSE Shattered Lives campaign, which is wrapped up the other year, um, and phase three of that campaign focused on falls from height and we advertised some electronic tools that businesses could use to help them understand the uh, requirements when working at height. What we've seen as well is uh, since the introduction of the regulations, many, many partners and stakeholders have produced their own job-specific guidance, uh, training courses, etc., unique for their industry. What I would say though, um, Despite a steady decline in the number of falls from height, they still remain one of the most common kinds of workplace fatality, which is obviously a huge worry for um, all concerned. I think there's not a week or even a day that goes by when I haven't read an article about an accident in the workplace as a result of a fall. And um, in worst case, obviously a fatality. And um, I think last year, as the slide suggests, there were 38 people who lost their lives as a result of a fall from height in the workplace. Four and a half thousand workers suffered a major injury as a result of a fall from height. These are statistics taken from uh, RIDO. So these are the ones that have been reported into HSE. The figures also suggest around 7,000 uh, workers suffered an injury that kept them off work for over three days. When you look at the, um, some of the details of that over the last 10 years, you can see that ladders account for about one in seven reported fall injuries, but nearly a quarter of all fatal falls. It's interesting that um, almost 90% of falls over the period weren't reported as over two meters. That's not to say they weren't over two meters, it's just that we haven't got that information when the uh, accident report was uh, taken. And again, it's no surprise that the, the top three sectors where the um, accidents and injuries occur in this area, construction, transportation, and manufacturing. So on our team, what we've been doing currently is looking at 2005-6 um, data as a baseline. The reason being that was when the, um, the regulations that I mentioned earlier were introduced. And we're looking at the impact the introduction of the regulations have had on falls accidents. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there, are, there has been a downward trend in the number of workers injured or killed as a result of a fall. 
We think this is largely down to um, what we've got in previous reviews. Better consideration, knowledge and understanding about the types of equipment to use. Um, we think the application of a goal setting approach, a risk based approach to, the, to worker height, better training, better education. And, um, you know, I've been out on a few sites and I've observed an awful lot of good practice um, that's developed over the, re over the years. However, obviously, we still need to do much more. We know that um, half of all employee fatal injuries were one of three kinds, and that is either being struck by a moving vehicle, being struck by a fallen object, or again, falling from a height. 70 in every 100,000 workers um, have a reportable non-fatal injury due to a fall, according to the Labour Force survey. By our calculations, last year there was over 400,000 working days lost as a result of falls injuries. More worryingly, um, one trend that has emerged is more than 40% of those who were fatal injured workers of known age were between the ages of 55 and 64 years old. So we're, we're concluding that the rate and severity of injury increases with age. Again, we know that movable ladders were the agents of injury and about one in fifth of fatal falls from height. And almost all of these injuries, all these fatals, were the, those who were classed as self-employed. Again, those in construction may remain most at risk. And it might be surprising to hear that where, the worker height regulations are the most enforced set of regulations um, by HSE and other inspectors. And it's regulation six in particular, for those who are familiar with the regulations, which is really the key to the regulations. This is about protecting people so far as reasonably practicable. And again, the most enforcement action is taken against this regulation, particularly in construction. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we've been doing with our partners and others over the years to actually prevent these injuries from occurring. One really successful, successful initiative was the um, ladder exchange, for those who are familiar with this initiative. And uh, if you want to take a headline from this initiative, over 10,000 dodgy ladders, I think that's a scouse term, isn't it, Nick? Dodgy ladders were taken out of circulation uh, thanks to the work of the Ladder Association and their partners working alongside HSE. That's been quite an achievement. Um, again, Ladder Exchange is an excellent example of partnership working between HSE and industry. And it's widely recognised now that the trade associations, such as the Ladder Association, are well placed now to promote safety in their industries, given their long established cross sector membership and all the contacts that they have. And um, myself and my team are looking forward now to the Ladder Association making a real success of future Ladder Exchange initiatives. They've handed over the reins from us. Um, I went to their AGM when this was announced. And this year's exchange, which we're about to advertise via a HSE e-bulletin, will give you the dates and we will signpost colleagues to the Ladder Association website for more details on this year's exchange. That should go out this week. And um, just a quick plug from me, for those of you who aren't already subscribed to HSE's e-bulletin service, we do have a specific one on uh, slips, trips and falls that you can get. Uh, it's usually a monthly update and it will provide you with the latest information on these topics. Of course, there's been many other initiatives um, and I've been engaged in a few more recently and I'll talk about these in more detail in a later slide. But we've been doing an awful lot on the work work on the team to uh, dispel a lot of the myths surrounding use of ladders, worker height, etc. that you see in the media. I thought it would be good just to include, um, just to give you some context, what, what's happening in the world, what's impacting health and safety as a whole and in particular my organisation. So I'd start by saying as an organisation, HSE always welcomes opportunities which the various reviews in government will provide 
um, to give us an independent view on what needs to change or what needs to improve. This is a means by which we ensure regulation, which has evolved over many, many years, continues to be relevant, current. Uh, it, it should have a common sense and proportionate approach to assessing the risks, and it should be easy to understand and navigate to. So, on the slide, um, this, these are some of the recent changes um, in our world of health and safety, and th these are triggering some of the uh, work that colleagues across HSC working with stakeholders are undertaking. Obviously, there was the comprehensive spending review which affected all government departments, and that was looking at better ways of uh, saving, obviously, taxpayers' money. So we're looking towards, within HSE, for example, the way we set ourselves up. So things like shared services, which is shared HR functions with other departments, as opposed to having our own HR function, that might be a way which will achieve some of the savings internally. Um, for those of you who remember Lord Young, uh, Common Sense, Common Safety was published in October 2010. But predominantly, that was focused on um, low-risk environments. Uh, so it was a lot of help for people working in offices, shops, uh, classrooms, etc., help and advice around um, the risk assessment process. Um, following that report by Lord Young, there was the ministerial announcement by Minister Grayling, our current minister, and he produced his own report, Good Health and Safety, Good for Everyone. And this was in March 11. And there were some key elements in this. This, this was where the, the Health and Safety Consultants Register was born from. This is also where there was a refocusing of HSE's inspection activities. And there were certain sectors where we won't be doing what we deem to be a proactive inspection. There was also an element of discussion around which, um, again, I'll give you some more information in a later slide, but around cost recovery as a result of inspection activities. And um, again, I'll cover that in more detail. But the report also announced a requirement for an independent review by Professor Lofsted, which again, if you look at the agenda over the next few days with the AIF, is um, a topic of much debate. There are numerous recommendations. I'll take you through them, um, just some of the highlights. I'll give you an update where I can on what, what HSE are doing against some of those. As, as well as the um, Lofstad review, I'm hoping people are aware of something called the Red Tape Challenge, which again, it, it's not primarily about health and safety legislation, but health and safety legislation did have a period in the spotlight where people could discuss issues and concerns they had with the various sets of regulations. And this, this Red Tape Challenge is ongoing. The information um, captured from the public and others during Red Tape Challenge is fed directly to ministers. And um, they have a panel, we refer to it as a star chamber, where our minister is in discussion with other cabinet ministers about some of the comments and issues raised by members of the public, stakeholders, industry, etc. And again, it's, it's starting to trigger some actions within HSC as a result. This, this process is continuing presently as well. It, it hasn't ended. It's ongoing. The, the aim of the Red Tape Challenge is basically to reduce the overall burden of regulation in the government's own words. Uh, there's more than 21,000 active sets of regulations in the UK. So as you can imagine, this is an easy task to review all of those. In relation to health and safety legislation, there was just under 1,400 comments received. Um, this was since April 11, and all of those comments received have been considered by Professor Lofstad when he undertook his review. It has to be said that most of the comments received in relation to health and safety legislation, I'm pleased to report, were very, very supportive. Again, comments in specifically in relation to the worker height, regulations were a bit mixed. Some, were, again, were very supportive of the regulations and the need to have them in the current form. But there is clearly a lot of misinterpretation of what the regulations require. And, um, you know, in certain sectors, not everyone's as clear, perhaps, as those who work in construction and other um, industries where perhaps these regulations are more commonly known. 
again, some of these issues are going to feed into um, a later review. I thought it would be also useful just to pause and look at some of the key recommendations made by Professor Lofstad in his report. And uh, this is a quick summary. The report came out, I think it was the 28th of November last year. And um, I've just picked off some of the key things that may be of interest to this particular audience. Um, there was a lot of discussion in the report about exempting those who are self-employed, whose work activities pose no risk to others from health and safety legislation. There was obviously a unique recommendation, a specific recommendation to review the worker height regulations, which I'll come on to more detail in a moment. Um, there was a review of all HSC's approved codes of practice. I think there's 52 approved codes of practice, and they sit between the regulations and the guidance. Um, they provide more detail on how to interpret the various regulations. It's interesting to note, though, there is no worker height ACOP, so we are not on our team part of that review. However, there are other recommendations around to review all the worker height guidance. Uh, this follows a recommendation going back to common sense, common safety. Now, there's 37 pieces of HSE-owned worker height publications in the various sectors. Most of these are in construction, agriculture, um, and transport. All of those publications, in fact, all of HSE's publications are, are currently being reviewed in various stages. So we have a list of the top 100 publications, which is our priority. And uh, worker height features heavily in that top 100. There's two key publications, the guide to the law and um, a guide on lad use, safe use of ladders and step ladders. Again, this particular review includes an element of working more closely with the, uh, the EU. They have their own reviews going on in next year, which look at the directives that come into play, which we transpose into UK law. So we are feeding into that review, and all these various activities will provide evidence to the EU about how the UK has transposed the requirements in the Temporary Worker Height Directive, for example. Again, this review has looked at about 200 pieces of health and safety legislation, and um, it's also looked about how the local authorities go about their inspection programme. There's also the issue of strict liability, uh, where there's an absolute in law, and again, this is something colleagues in HSE are working on at the moment. Similar to red tape, as well as informing um, Professor Lofstad's conclusions, this work that Professor Lofstad done has been reviewed by uh, the Minister and um, Ministers in Government. I'm hoping people are aware there's been also, as a result of some of the recommendations, we've seen the launch of what we're calling two challenge panels. So essentially, channels, what we call challenge panel one, um, this is where people can actually um, challenge a decision made by an inspector and get it looked at by an independent panel. And as far as I'm aware, we haven't had any referrals through on that yet, certainly not for worker height. Uh, that was launched in January. The, the other challenge panel, um, I mentioned earlier about a lot of work we're doing around myth busting. So this is where someone who's been a uh, subject to um, a health and safety decision, if they don't think the advice they've been given is correct, it could be via a consultant or a colleague, etc. they can put the, um, the case to a challenge panel and it's headed up by our chair, Judith Packett, and the panel will look at the information provided and give people a steer on whether the advice they've been given is correct or not. Now, this has sparked quite a lot of debate in HSC. We've had quite a run of referrals since its launch the other month, and uh, we've certainly had a couple on a worker height already. I mean, just to give you an example, we had a school teacher who'd worked in a school for 20 years, had had some stepladder training, and they were required to climb approximately six foot up a fixed secured ladder to switch on some lights for a performance of a show. 
uh, that was contributing towards the children's GCSEs. And um, the turnaround for these decisions that we have to work to is 48 hours. So this school teacher contacted us on the Friday and wanted a decision by the Monday to see if the exams could go ahead. The advice they got from a bursar in the school was not to climb the ladder without some fixed ladder training. Again, it's all about proportionate and common sense approach. Our chair got in touch with the teacher and basically said, the show must go on. You've been doing it for 20 years. Risk assessment shows, you know, you understand the risks involved. It's six foot up a ladder, you flick a switch, you come down. The advice was obviously longer term, try and adapt it so the work could be done at ground level in keeping with our hierarchy. But again, this was as a result of a, a new bursar arriving in the school and perhaps giving some disproportionate advice to that school teacher. And these are the types of things we're seeing coming through these various challenge panels. We've also published um, a list of top 10 health and safety myths. So as well as um, actually publishing some of the decisions from the challenge panel, we have um, a list of top 10 myths which we uh, regularly update to. And this is all on our website. So just going back to the fewer regulations or better regulations, as I mentioned earlier, there's about 200 health and safety regulations in scope, a red tape challenge in the Lofsted Review. And this slide just sort of quickly summarizes our current proposals. We signed up to this in the budget in April. So as you can see, 26 pieces of regulation. This is mostly out-of-date regulations we're looking to scrap. And there'll be consultations on this throughout the year. There's two packages. I think at least one of them's already out for consultation. These are old, obsolete sets of regulations that are just not current anymore. The biggest portion we're looking to improve, obviously 70% of the regulations we have responsibility for. And we're looking to keep 14% um, largely unchanged. We've also been able to um, identify that other departments um, should take ownership of certain sets of regulations. So I'm going to go back to um, worker height, what all this means for work, the worker height regulations. So this slide sort of quotes what Professor Lofsted said he would like HSE and the partners to do, and this was to review the regulations and the associated guidance by April next year. Um, the intention is we need to look at what potentially is making businesses go beyond perhaps what the law requires, maybe some overzealous application of the regulations. We need to understand the reasons. Again, the majority of comments we receive are very supportive of these regulations. And I'm aware of the, um, the submissions from the access industry, very helpful submissions to Professor Lofsted, um, which set out their case. We're conducting a deeper analysis of some of the responses that have been highlighted to us. And um, there are concerns still in certain sectors about issues around definitions. And you'll see, if you were to look at the Lofsted Review commentary, he talks about definitions of worker height itself. People do not always in every sector understand what we mean by worker height. There is still talk in some areas of it being above two meters, above four meters, etc. So there's obviously some um, need to clarify some of the definitions we, we use. There was also a lot of talk about ladders and step ladders. Are they in scope of the um, directive? The directive talks about portable ladders, which encompass via the European standards, the definition of you know, various types of step ladders. Um, so again, there's issues there about understanding um, the types of equipment and the definitions. We have to look at where perhaps people are going beyond the scope of the directive in the UK and certainly uh, is that as a result of our own regulations and guidance. We, as an organisation, HSE has agreed now with the Minister to meet this timetable for the review and deliver the recommendations as set out in Lofsted's report and in the subsequent government response. So policy work on my team has begun and this began immediately after the reports were published. And again, we've, we're setting out our plans for implementing these recommendations. Um, unfortunately today, I have to say, and I've spoken to Neil Tomlinson ahead of this, um, we've explained that we're not 
in a position to give a more detailed update on what our proposals and plans are. The reason for that is not least there's still work going on within governments, discussions with ministers about the detail of the recommendations and how they want them delivered. Again, this is true with the worker height review. And again, I know obviously the access industry will be disappointed we have to say that today. But again, the timings of this event don't quite lend itself to our timings. And obviously there'll be some panel debates later, which we are, myself and my colleague, are very interested in hearing. But you'll, you'll note we won't be taking part in them panel discussions later on during the event for these reasons. So just in terms of the future, Again, HSC as a whole, not just in, in the area of worker height, is looking to deliver better guidance, particularly to the smaller end of the market, small businesses, micro businesses, sole traders. Um, we're carrying on our work, delivering the recommendations made by Professor Lofsted. And again, we'll obviously talk more at a later date about the review of the worker height regulations to all our stakeholders. Um, I would encourage everyone to take part in what will be many consultations over the next one or two years. It's a real opportunity to have your say. Um, I think the, a, a big consultation that will um, hopefully be delivered during June through to September is the review on all the approved codes practice. So we will set out what our, our thoughts are in relation to each individual code of practice and allow everyone to uh, comment. Again, we need to make sure any review is balanced. So we will be looking at good and bad practice in amongst all of this. We will not just be focusing on the negative. There is a lot of good practice out there that we've observed that needs to be fed into the report. We've already gathered evidence from the two consultations I've talked about today. They form a big part of the review. And again, please be aware the red tape challenge is still ongoing. I would also like to point out, in terms of future where HSC has been working in uh, collaboration with the access industry. And in particular, um, my colleague has been working on the subcommittee for training and guidance. And we've been looking at contributing towards a new training course, Worker Height for Managers. And that work is ongoing. It's a, a, one of our colleagues, Nick, you've been leading on that. And through this subcommittee, the purpose is to introduce managers to the subject of worker height, all aspects of worker height, and provide them with the information they need to advise their workers how to go about their jobs safely. And again, I would like to reiterate, HSE will continue to support the AIF in that work, alongside any review uh, that we are currently responsible for. But again, um, I've, I've heard last week that Professor Lofsted maybe coming back to do a review of his own recommendations in the autumn so we'll, it may be worth keeping an eye on that to see what's going on uh, and what he'll report on publicly so again um, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy if we have time I think I'm on time to uh, we have to wrap up or if there are any burning issues or questions, then um, I'm happy to take them in the margins when uh, colleagues have a moment. Hi, Paul. What benefit do you think the HSE have in having all of the associations at an event like this? It provides an excellent opportunity for us to uh, update everyone on the latest developments in the world of health and safety. And again, the uh, AIF knowledge base, obviously, in terms of work at height, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to inform members of the issues that are coming up in the, uh, over the next few months that will uh, impact on their daily working lives. Can you, uh, can you tell me what new information you've received from today's talk? Uh, we, we are from the Italian, mm -hmm. the Italian University. Uh, we, we are here for... Uh, for, uh, for What new information did you find out from today's talk? Um, about the new figures for the, um, uh, for the working on white deaths last year, 2007-2011, that I wasn't aware of. 
and also the new training program for, for managers yep. for working nights as well, which I also wasn't aware of as well. 